so I guess a first quick setup question. Uh, is the font size okay or should I zoom in a little bit? Like if this is um, if this is not well, if this is okay, please raise your hand. In particular people in the back. Can you do the view toggle header and toggle toolbar? Uh, that was something very technical there. You obviously know a lot more than I do. Uh-huh. I mean I'm good at cussing at these things. Um uh, ah, ah, technology, nice. Uh -huh. Oh, this thing, okay. Ah, okay. I mean, this is why we keep you around. Excellent, thank you. Uh, wow. Yeah, would not have come up with that one on my own. Okay, cool. You and your <laughs> okay, let's try 120%. I mean, this one goes to 12, not only to 11. Uh, how about that? I can't guarantee that everything else looks fine inside of there. I, I, I hope it does. Microphone. Microphone. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just saying, I mean, if you want to come up here and do it, no. Uh, no, you, you are a lot better at this than I am. The only thing I'm good at when it comes to when it comes to iPython notebooks is complaining when they don't work. I'm a professional when it comes to that. Okay, so we have a, we have a third member, a very valuable one. Um, unfortunately, uh, the um, whichever airline he's riding uh, decided to have some issues. So um, I think as long as we get the video of him being dragged off, well. That will be fine if we want it. Oh, God. I, I like... No, come on. I mean, it's, it's a nice library. We don't want that to happen to him. All right. So, um, I guess we're about three minutes in. L let's give it another two because, I mean, that's another prime, I guess. Um, and let's see what, let's see what happens. Um, hopefully, he shows up. So, we got an email. I think it was, what, like 10 minutes to three or something like that after us sending repeated emails saying, uh, where are you? And then we got a response saying, I'm currently at SFO. Uh, so yeah, while we get, so I mean, is the GPU stuff looking, is the GPU Julia box stuff? Uh, by the way, can, can I have a confirmation that this little thingy that is like attached to me? Uh, Mr. Video, person in a gloriously nice orange shirt in the back. Okay, can someone poke him? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is the is this little thing working as well? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't say that, but uh, thank you for thank you for the confidence. Um, is the GPU Julia box stuff working? Okay. Um, all right. Let's get started uh, in terms of setup. So my name is uh, Pontus Stenetop, and uh, I'm here today with uh, Mike Ennis and yeah, John. Um, that I wish was here. Uh, and we decided to put together a little bit of a deep learning with Julia tutorial. Now, the goal of this thing is to kind of not really be that deep and theoretical and heavy in terms of the maths. I will do a little bit of maths and sorry to be in the last slot, but there will be derivatives. Um, but before we get started, so we have an awesome GPU Julia box instance. Um, where you should be able to sign in and get a GPU Power Julia box. So if you see the link, I guess, I mean, I can just point here, I guess. Uh, if you see this little link here, like the GPU Julia box thing, which we have right here, right? Uh, just type that into your favorite browser and please log in. And if you do get these exact notebooks, please tell us. Um, I sincerely hope that you do. Um, that's a bit of an odd audio thing there. So while we're waiting, I guess we can get you guys started with that because you should be able to follow along. Um, also, I made sure that I didn't fix the random seed, so each and every single one of you will get a unique experiment <laughs> based on uh, based on a pseudo random neural number generator. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it's almost like Minecraft. Um, so yeah, uh, if you want to run things locally, uh, we have made the, uh, all of the notebooks and all of the material necessary um, available. So you can use this little GitHub link here and you can also clone and yeah, take them home with you. Uh, my hope is that after we're done with this, you'll be able to apply some machine learning techniques 
to, and in particular deep learning techniques, to your own data and do something cool with it. Um, if you need inspiration um, or ideas, just grab us. We'll be around for most of the conference. Um, interestingly enough, it's also seven minutes past midnight right now in London, and that's where my body is. So I guess it's a great time to give a tutorial. So the people I'm here with is Mike Innes, which works with Eulia Computing. He's responsible for the machine learning infrastructure, which is kind of cool. Uh, much more of an impact than what I usually do. Uh, it's also in charge of the Junior IDE, which is, I think, the only IDE that I, as a Vim user, actually consider to be maybe worthwhile investigating. So have a look at Juno. It's cool. Um, John should also be here. He's an awesome PhD candidate over at MIT, and he has implemented this little thing called TensorFlow.jl, uh, which I would argue is in many ways is better than its uh, Python counterpart. So that's worth checking out. He should be demoing that if he can get here. Uh, and then, of course, there's me. Um, I am, yeah, I guess this thing is just like fancy name for researcher and not tenured. Um, person at University College London. I usually do natural language processing research, which is, I guess, I usually describe it as me sitting and staring into a computer screen and arguing that I'm somehow teaching computers how to handle human language. Um, I preferably do it for Julia, uh, even though my uh, PI uh, has uh, kind of beaten me a bit with the Python bat recently. So. Can I get a confirmation, by the way, that the GPU Julia box thing is working? You're not getting like 405s. You're getting 500s. Awesome. Then it's working exactly like it did two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> consistency, that is what we're going for. So uh, I guess. Uh, I have to try refreshing a couple of times. Uh, it's going to take a while to boot the machine, so uh, give, it, give it a couple of goes. If it doesn't work, uh, you can get these packages, so if you're on point five, yeah. uh, Knet, which uh, Pontus will be using, is just a package to add away. So yep. try that uh, if, if it's all working for you. I think I did the package ads also like implicitly. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I did that. I could have botched that up. Uh, but do copy. I mean, I'm going to go away from this uh, notebook fairly soon, so do copy this little thing here, or just search for like GitHub Ninja, uh, and you should get it. Nope, that's not jump. All right. So I'll get started, because in the beginning, it's, not, it's mostly going to be slides and me talking about how cool deep learning is. So when we designed this workshop, the whole idea was that we would make minimal assumptions in terms of your background. I think that currently is, if there's any point in time where you want to get into deep learning and, in particular, and also machine learning, this is the time. Deep learning is the most trivial and simple machine learning method pretty much out there. And I'm probably going to get some flack for saying that. But that is at least the way I look at it. I mean, do you understand matrix multiplication? Most people do to some degree. Do you understand partial derivatives? All right, well, you're pretty much done. I mean, you need a bag of hacks as well, but that's pretty much the whole of deep learning right there. Um, I, I wish I was joking. I mean, in the machine learning community, we have a pretty bad reputation among the people that do true things. And they're like, these kids with the simple things that just work. Arr. Um, one of the goals we have as well is that you should gain some sort of intuitive understanding of machine learning and deep learning. Now, it was tempting when we created this thing to just give you essentially like a bunch of copy-paste things and then you have a model running. The problem with machine learning is that it is kind of like you don't have many guarantees and when things go wrong, being able to debug it, the kind of intuition that you guys have from doing any kind of other programming won't necessarily apply. So having some understanding of a little bit of theory will most likely help you guys not thinking that it's just magic when it breaks. So hopefully you'll understand things like words like objective slash loss function, what optimization is, over underfitting and some regularization stuff and have some familiarity with some deep learning models. And this is mostly what I will be covering. Um, we also talk a little bit about what Julia currently provides. I think Julia is the future for not just machine learning and deep learning, but in general as a programming language. And it's, that's, I guess, why I'm here. I mean, we're kind of biased, aren't we? Um, and hopefully, you should be able to know and build. And as I said, being able to debug your models and understand when they go wrong. And hopefully, also understand when, it, when you're cheating. Because I found that quite a lot of people that think they understand machine learning don't actually understand that they're cheating. Um, that's fascinating. So yeah, this is very optimistic for two hours. Or 
one hour and 50 minutes. Uh, but we'll do our best. And as I said, we'll be around for the whole works, the, well, the, the whole of Julia concept. So just poke us and drag us somewhere and then talk to us. We're kind of friendly, friendly people, most of us. Um, so in terms of outline, I will first talk about uh, deep learning at a glance, like what it actually is, because there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Uh, so I want to show that off as a mo motivating factor and also for you guys to know a little bit of the lay of the land. Then I will do an make an attempt at what I call machine learning from scratch, where we start with pretty much as simple as it gets and then gradually work ourselves upwards from there. And then we'll go into pretty much what deep learning and deep learning frameworks are. And then John and Mike will carry over and they will have some actual real cool stuff. I will actually do kind of boring stuff. But um, if you understand the boring stuff, the cool stuff becomes even better. All right, let's see. So that's the end of the first notebook. Now I need to, ah, there we go. Uh, yeah, technology. Uh, there we go. I just want to point out, I'm not a PowerPoint user. Usually, even though I might seem like it right now, it's just that I'm used to slides rather than <laughs> this stuff. Okay, so let's start with deep learning. Now, it's a, very fan it's a very fancy name. I generally don't like calling things deep learning because it feels a bit pretentious, but fair enough. So the, uh, like the theoretical underpinnings and like the early stuff in terms of both machine learning and what we nowadays call deep learning, actually goes back as far as far back as the 50s. So this is a picture that I don't know if I'm really allowed to share like this, but, but uh, there was no copyright statement on the homepage. So, so this is Rosenblatt. I think this is probably late 50s, where they have what they refer to as the Mark I perceptron. And Rosenblatt had this fairly unique idea back in the, back in the 50s, which was that maybe we can draw uh, parallels between artificial intelligence and uh, biological reasoning. So he wanted to draw inspiration from the brain, how the brain works. He didn't necessarily want to emulate it, but maybe the form of computation you wanted to perform could look similar to the way that things work in the brain. And this is a perceptron. So this one was, I think it was capable of recognizing digits and uh, us using, a photo using a photo sensor. And this is quite cool and it's also how should I say, like this is back in the good old days where you still had like hard, speci special built hardware as well. So this is quite early on. Now, just like machine learning in general, there has been ups and downs. There is actually a concept referred to as uh, machine learning winter or AI winter. I guess actually AI winter, machine learning and, okay. It's a bit unfair to say that machine learning and AI is the same. There are plenty of people doing AI without machine learning, but today it's pretty much synonymous. And there have been, there's a winter, it pretty much means that we've failed to live up to people's expectations and then there's no money and no faith from anyone. Currently, it's summer. So it's great to be machine learning and AI right now. So back in the 50s and 60s, uh, we had the first biologically inspired computation, uh, like the perceptron. And then in the 70s, uh, Marvin Minsky, and uh, I can't remember the name, uh, his first name, pu and Puppet published a book called Perceptrons, um, which pretty much damned the um, certain aspects of what a perceptron actually could do. Rosenblatt that created it had pretty much the idea that you could learn, it could pretty much learn to be as intelligent as a human, and uh, Minsky and Puppet disagreed. So people lost faith and maybe not rightfully so, the book didn't really show that. In the 80s there was a resurgence and the idea of what is usually referred to as connectionism and the invention, I mean okay, depends on who you ask. If you ask, uh, if, if you ask uh, Schmidt Huber, which is a giant in the field, he would say that the backpropagation probably was invented by Leibniz, but uh, most people think that it was invented roughly in the 80s. Uh, connectionism is this idea that essentially intelligence arises naturally out of, uh, computa like out of computational systems. And uh, pretty much like our brain would have multiple layers and it has some computational ability and consciousness and intelligence just arises out of that system. So what if we just had these huge computers inspired by this biology, then maybe intelligence would kind of arise out of it. There's plenty of criticism of the idea, but uh, it's still around today. Um, for example, if you know this guy called Hinton, Jeffrey Hinton, um, he's, yeah, there you go. Well, he isn't here, but yeah. Uh, so he was one of, the, one of the proponents of this kind of ideas back in the 80s. Uh, in the 90s we had advances just convolutional networks where we had, the, I think it was in the early 90s, state of the art in terms of things like image recognition. 
But one of the things in the 90s, and this is where the name deep learning really comes from, uh, that we were always limited in terms of how deep we could have our networks. And by depth I mean essentially the number of steps that you would chain into each other. So if you look at your brain you have thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of different layers of connections like synapses that feed, in, feed into others in these huge chains. Now when it came to neural networks we were really only able to train about three layers. Now that's plenty of computational, uh, computational power in there but networks could never really go deeper than that. And this was a hard barrier. And thus, interest kind of died off uh, towards, the, towards, the end, towards the end of the 90s. And instead, people uh, were using mainly things like feature-based learning, things like uh, linear, cla linear classifiers, and things like uh, margin-based classifiers, such as, for example, SVMs. And they were dominating pretty much well into the late 2000s. And yeah, about 2008, 2009, deep learning came back with a vengeance and now it's so hot that it's almost shameful to be working on this kind of stuff. Um, as I guess as a scientist also there are ideologies in science so there is this famous uh, bet from I think it's from 1995 where you had Jaquel betting uh, against Vapnik so one of them bet that one of them bet that by 2000 people will actually understand how big neural networks work we still don't do that today, by the way, so we lost that one. Um, and Vapnik bet that, I, I think, uh, let's, let's see, where is the statement? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Vapnik bets one fancy dinner that by two fa March 14th, 2005, no one in his right mind will use neural nets that are essentially like those used in 1995. Um, both failed, um, but it was only a couple of, years, couple of years off in terms of the neural networks. The networks and a lot of the stuff that we use nowadays pretty much goes back to the 80s and the, 80s and the 90s, in terms of how, 90s in terms of how they work. What has changed is mostly our understanding and our access to data. And that's quite fascinating. So yeah, witnessed by Jan Le Kuhn there. So some of the early recent successes. So as I said, the idea of deep learning is pretty much that you don't specify all of the representations and how your network looks like. I mean, it's very easy to say that I have a model that just looks at specific pixels. But if you're in a deep learning paradigm, the idea if you're doing something like an image classification, and as in machine machine learning, right? If I ask you to write an algorithm that takes as input an image and determines what kind of animal is on that picture, I mean, do you roughly know like the first part of code that you would write. I mean, maybe you would look at some patterns, maybe you would design some things. Now, the idea of deep learning is that we should not try to think about necessarily how these representations are made. Rather, instead, we should try to have force the machine to learn a hierarchy of representations that are good and tuned for the purpose. So this is a convolutional neural network. And this convolutional neural network would pretty much apply feature maps, which are these kind of, say for example, edge detectors, that try to look at an image and look, apply it at each and every single spot, and then it builds another representation that then feeds into another representation that feeds into another representation. And then at the top, you would have these classification layers. And here up is the kind of reasoning. So you're building pretty much a representation of the image. And then after that, you will have this kind of, you will have this kind of reasoning layer that goes at the, goes at the bottom. And this works remarkably well. Uh, this is the dominating technology in terms of how image recognition works today. And they're also behind some of the successes even outside of computer vision. So thank you, by the way, Shashi, for allowing me to embed this video. I could not have done this without you. So one of the really, really cool things from a couple of years ago is Google DeepMind's Deep Q learning. So this is uh, reinforcement learning. We're not going to go into details exactly what that is. It's a kind of machine learning. But what is really cool is that this AI that we're going to watch essentially learns how to play the game just by looking at the pixels in the same sense that you and I do. I mean, we don't have, like, when you play Mario, you don't have the actual game state and the 8-bit assembly code actually running inside of your head. Rather, you are looking at an image and you're building some sort of representation inside of your head. Now, this is exactly what this algorithm does. So, there we go. Internet works. Okay, there we go. My computer hasn't crashed yet. So this is from Two Minute Papers on YouTube, which has a bunch of awesome videos. So yeah, the important thing to know is that this AI has no understanding of what, like left and right. The only thing it understands is that it sees something and it can push buttons. 
That's the only thing the AI learns. So after 10 minutes of training, and also it understands what score is. Yeah, there we go. It learns to play, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, not, not, not entirely useless, but uh, mildly useless. But it gets better over time. So as the algorithm is exposed, essentially, to seeing that the score increases, it learns that, okay, if the score is increasing, I'm doing the right thing. So yeah, here we go. After about two hours of training, we're not going to train this kind of stuff today, especially not on my crappy little laptop. So you see, after two hours of training, it's actually performing quite well. I mean, this is, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess it's sped up a little bit, but uh, this looks like me when I was a teenager and had some time. Um, nowadays, uh, no. So yeah, I used to be at an AI slash games lab. Here we go, after about four hours of training. Now, essentially, it learns the magic trick that I think all of you guys know if you played Breakout, that the way you should really solve this thing is that, yeah, yeah, there we go, come on, go to the left. Uh, the way that you really play, play breakout, right, is that you don't really want to do any work, so you want to have the ball, and there we go, yeah, ball upstairs, yeah, there we go, sold. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is, the kind of this is the kind of cool stuff, so, yeah, go on. Is, is that 240 minutes of training uh, time spent optimizing, or training data in Minutes of video. It actually has not minutes of training. Like the way that you would uh, strap and set this thing up is that you would allow it to play the game on its own. So it's 240 minutes of itself. Uh, so what you do, okay, so this is, sorry, this is like, now I'm breaking the rule of like keeping things simple. Essentially what it does is that it plays, it plays the game and it rolls out and it has certain decisions and it does a rollout on that, which, and then it learns from essentially these previous sequences that it's been, that it's been playing. Uh, so 240 minutes, I think, is the clock, like the wall clock time in terms of how long it's been running on your computer. Um, when I say 240 minutes, you can, if you have a gaming PC, uh, you can do this. And we'll get to that shortly. Like one of these machines, like in order to train one of these things, you don't necessarily need to be Google um, or any other big company for that matter. Uh, if you have a gaming PC that can play reasonably modern games, you can train these things. Um, similarly, I think this was, this was last year, right? where we had this amazing feat where people were pretty much arguing that the game of Go, so who here is familiar with Go? Okay, it's uh, not bad. Um, like it's, I wouldn't say that it's a more complex game. In terms of rules, it has simpler rules than chess. Uh, it's just that the possibilities are less constrained. You can put one of these stones pretty much anywhere on the board. And this means that complexity grows quite a lot quicker. And people were believing that you wouldn't be able to have like a Go playing AI on a human level for at least another 10 or 20 years. Now, I was around um, eating pizza, so I didn't actually work on this. Uh, but I was over for Pizza DeepMind back in the day when uh, they were pretty much hiring people in order to do this. And it took them, I think, about a year or nine months uh, with, a, uh, with like a focused effort in order to build this AI, which then beat uh, Lisa Dole, which was, I think it was like ranked number three in the world. And that's an amazing feat. Uh, now, in terms of like technological innovation, like it was not a much of a technological innovation, but it was definitely like, you know, it was a technological innovation. Like there weren't so many theory things that came out of this work. They pretty much just showed this can be done in the same way that Deep Blue did back in the 90s, and that's amazing. Um, so the way it works pretty much is that I'm not expecting you to read and understand this figure. It's from the paper. It's fairly accessible, just like most nature papers. But what the, what the network essentially does is that it looks at all possible positions. It evaluates using a tree evaluation, like where it should move, and then gradually moves along and tries to prune down and see where should I put my next stone based on my previous game experience in order to make the best possible decision. And AlphaGo essentially was able to look further into the future than make more intelligent moves than a human being. And if you want to look at that really, really cool link, the, actually, are the, are the GPU instances working now? Are we still getting 500 errors? OK, who, who got it working? Hands up. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I think we want to work on those numbers. Uh, OK, can you go and bust him or some people a little bit? And then maybe we can. Yeah, because I can only talk for so long. Uh, go through it. Yeah, yeah I'll, go f I'll go through and show it. People instructions to do at K -Net. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. I was able to download the notebook. Yeah, um, it, it, it's fair enough. Um, it was just would have been cool to give everyone a GPU for an, for an hour or two. Um, so yeah, 
And also recently, so yeah, I highly recommend this link, which is uh, essentially how AlphaGo actually has t taught humans how to make new innovations and think differently about the game. So this is a concrete example where an AI actually informs human thinking. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, especially since a lot of people often question whether or not AI can actually innovate. This is a much more recent work. I think this is from, uh, from the Google team in London, if I remember correctly, where they used these kind of uh, time-diluted convolutions in order to create speech, to do speech synthesis. So you would have like a text as input and you want the computer to speak out in a human way, uh, the like in a natural nice sound. And they had a couple of really cool innovations in this paper. This is a really nice paper. It's a little bit dense though. So, Usually, if you're used to like Microsoft Bob or whatever the uh, thing is called, if you have Windows, uh, I have something that's older than that. It sounds even worse. Uh, something they usually look sound something like this. Let's see if it works. Eric and Adventure film directed by Randall Yeah. So this is like an old school parametric model. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. I mean, you can hear, like, I mean, there's something a little bit unnatural about it. I mean, you can understand, but it's certainly you wouldn't mistake this thing for a human, right? Uh, there's also con concatenative models. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Okay, this is, sounds a little bit better. This print was state of the, the state of the art, like, last year. But you can still hear this kind of, like, cracking. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. I mean, for example, like you can hear that the like the pace pretty much is a little bit odd. It sounds a bit staggered. Now, this is uh, the Google WaveNet speech synthesis method. It sounds like this. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. I mean, the, the the only the only move you can do right. Uh, I mean, the, the the only winning move is not to play. Um, Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. So that's a machine speaking to you. And that's fairly natural. Let's try this one again. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. This is really cool. And this is based on, I think, um, so I was at a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think this was maybe, was like 40 hours of a professional, uh, I don't know what to call these people, professional speaker, but that's not really what it is either. A professional person that reads and speaks text. I'm sure there's a fancy name for that, but uh, it, it eludes me. And this is a really cool innovation. Yes, go on. A uh, quick note about the GPU. So the, the boxes do take a little while to start up. So if it's just hanging, uh, if you just wait, it should be OK. And if you get an error of some sort, refresh and wait again. Yeah. Um, yeah. If that's not working, we will like, have another route to doing that. But if you're patient, it should be OK, I think. Yeah, we, we, have, we have backups. Yeah. We always have backups. Yeah, I guess we can do Liabird, but um, maybe I want to start Chrome for that. Actually, can, do, you, can you promise to do Liabird when you start? Uh, I run some sort of like horrible, horrible strapped down, super paranoid version of Firefox. Um, also from 2015. So this is uh, a paper that came out of, I think it was, was it Darmstadt, if I remember correctly? Uh, no, it was Tübingen. No, it was Tübingen. Um, in, Ge in Germany. And initially, when the, this paper came out, uh, pretty much everyone in the machine learning community didn't really believe what they were seeing. So what they did is that they used one of these convolutional networks that we saw earlier. And they would take an image, so this is from Tübingen, obviously, um, and they would take a piece of art, like say for example, uh, this is Starry Night by Van Gogh, um, if I remember correctly. And they would take these networks, so they would have one network and they would strap it on top of the source image and then they would take another network and strap it on top of the target image and then they would use these high level hierarchical representations in order to transfer the style and the look of the image onto another. So here you see the same image, you see image A here but looking a bit like Starry Night. And similarly here in D, you see like say for example the sky has now turned very very similar to like the screen. Now, a lot of people pointed out that this has actually been done kind of in the past, but the cool thing about this is that this falls naturally out of things that are learned without any supervision. They essentially took a network that was good at recognizing cats and dogs, and they used the same network in order to be able to transfer style. Now that's cool. That's really cool. So yeah, that's a highly, that's a really, actually, it's a fairly accessible paper as well if you want to go and read it. And the way that it works is that you can see pretty much that there are style features on different layers. So you have these like small style features living down here, like specific like little brush strokes and like specific choices in color 
And these are then composed, that are composed and composed and composed. And then here, up at B, right, we can kind of see the contours of the actual image. And then you would essentially transfer it like this. So that's a really nice paper from 2015. So people essentially didn't really believe that it was possible. Then they re-implemented it because they didn't release the implementation. And within a couple of days, the whole community was amazed over the fact that this worked. Nobody believed in it. Uh, if you want to try it out on your own images and you have a GPU, it takes about uh, a day or two to uh, search out all possibilities. Um, you can transfer things onto your own images at home as well. There are Julia implementations, but this is the one that I know of uh, that was released very early that's unfortunately not in Julia. Um, another innovation that came from deep learning is the idea of learning representations of words. Uh, and this is something that is very dear to my own heart because I've done quite a lot of research in this area. So back before uh, learning representations of words, the general way we would do things is that we would enumerate all words. We would take, say for example, a vocabulary of four million words, and then we would say that, okay, cat is one, dog is two, animal is four, Berkeley is 17, and then we would just simply enumerate them and refer to them as numbers. And then when they were presented to the machine, the machine wouldn't necessarily read something like the cat chases the dog, rather the machine would read something like four, five, seven, ten, right? It would have no idea really of uh, things like semantic relationships between these words and it wouldn't really have any understanding of like subcomponents of these words. And this made it more difficult for our algorithms to generalize. Uh, now this doesn't always help, like uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's pretty cool. So this thing that you're seeing right here, that you probably can't see what the heck that thing is, but this was like the big bomb pretty much when it comes to deep learning and natural language processing, because if you zoom in, so this is learned from data that's unannotated. This is learned by an algorithm that simply reads Wikipedia and a bunch of news for quite some time, and then this just falls out of the data. So you can see things, for example, like if you look down here in the corner, you can see things like Lee, Martin, Thomas, James. Okay, so the algorithm essentially understands now that these kind of are person names and they're related. They're no longer unique numbers, they're related to each other. And you can see things like dollar and dollar, so singulars and plurals end up close to each other. Up here we seem to be talking about weather, so we have like summer, winter, weather, storm. And when you plug these things into your machine learning algorithm, even if you're not using deep learning, it improves performance. And that was a huge deal. Um, now we kind of moved on and we're interested in like how to encode sentences and paragraphs and everything using these kinds of things, but still, I, I kind of like this. Um, it also turns out that you can use algebra on this, so you can do something like uh, king minus man plus woman, and since these are essentially vectors in, in a high dimensional space, you end up with another point. Now what is the closest thing to that point? Well it turns out the closest thing to that point is queen. So you can pretty much do this kind of, this kind of reasoning in, this, in these spaces that are simply learned latently by asking an algorithm to just look at Wikipedia and read Wikipedia. That's fascinating stuff. Uh, this is a slide, shameless plug, uh, from my JuliaCon 2015 talk, I think. Um, so currently we're using things like recurrent neural networks where you pretty much read, say for example, character by character or word by word. So you pretty much have something that is akin to a differentiable state machine where you can feed this input and it stores. So here essentially in this state here, it will store that, okay, I've seen a J, here like, I've seen a U, I've seen an L, I've seen an I, I've seen an A. And then after that you start saying, okay, so you now read the whole word, give me phonetically how this would sound in Japanese. And then you have another, you have another part of the network where you decode your input and you unpack it. So it would be like a Julia kind of here. So it would say like Julia. I, okay, this is hard. I mean, this is a compound, but yeah, whatever. Um, and this has been used successfully. So this, I think, is actually the algorithm that, uh, that is currently used for machine translation at Google. Uh, it has been used for things like, let's see, like caption. It has been used for caption generation. It's been used for chatbots. It's been used for quite a lot. It's a really, really versatile, really cool algorithm. Um, this encoder, decoder network, and re recurrent neural networks. So, uh, now we talked about cool stuff and uh, uh, things that have gone right. Um, these models don't always work. Um, so, we've got made a lot of advances. So, there is, usually, there is usually this little thing in terms of AI that the things that are easy for an AI, people think are amazing. Say, for example, like beating people in Go. To me, that is actually not that surprising. 
But things, on the other hand, that are difficult for, a, for an AI, it turns out to be fairly easy for human beings, and thus humans get fairly, fairly disappointed when they interact with AIs. One might, for example, imagine that if we can beat someone at Go, why can't I have a robot that cleans my house? It turns out that cleaning your house is actually more complicated than beating the, person, uh, the best person in the world at Go. Now, most people wouldn't believe that, but that is actually the case, at least in terms of AI. And it's not just because your home is messy. So uh, this, I think, is from, uh, from last year. So um, people usually say, like, will you, be, uh, will you be out of a job? And I usually say, no, uh, we haven't solved everything yet. So this is uh, Google last year, where they started translating Russia to Mordor. Um, in an, I, I like the quotation marks from the BBC, by the way, here, when they say like, they, they believe it was an automated error. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it was intentional. Um, and I also like that the surname of, uh, surname of Sergei Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister, was translated to sad little horse. <laughs> Uh, this is a real case. I also remember a couple of years ago when uh, I was able to do translate. I think I was playing around with... Uh, they're getting better, by the way. Like, all of these systems are getting better. Um, there are a lot of, like, play with words in Swedish that doesn't really work anymore. They're still garbage in Japanese, but that's because of other reasons. Uh, but I remember, for example, being able to write in Swedish, I went to Stockholm yesterday, and then the translation system would tell me, I went to London yesterday, in English. Uh, but it's true. It's called, I mean, it's actually quite fascinating. It's what we usually refer to as semantic dri uh, this kind of like semantic drift, where most likely the sense of the word Stockholm used here is capital rather than the actual entity. And it's not entirely obvious which, which one is the one that you want to translate. Um, if you want to go for something which is slightly worse, uh, we had Tay last year, which probably made it out in the news, which was uh, Microsoft's awesome attempt at machine learning and having a chatbot that was supposed to talk to cool teenagers on social media. Um, and it gave this wonderful, wonderful caption. Capt no, where is it? Did I cut out? Oh, here we go. Here. This is probably one of my f f favorite phrases in news of all time, which is, Microsoft has apologized for creating an artificial intelligent chatbot that quickly turned into a Holocaust-denying racist. <laughs> now, that's a sentence that I didn't really expect myself to be saying. Um, but thank you, Microsoft. You made it possible. So while we're, still, we're good at doing certain things, it's very clear that these algorithms don't really reach human-level reasoning. And they're certainly not equipped with the kind of common sense that most of us have. And we still have some way to go. Um, I think it's more than 10 or 15 years, but maybe my grandchildren will actually t see true AI. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist but still a realist. So a good question is like, why is actually all of these revolutions happening right now? Like, is there some amazing theoretical breakthrough or like this genius that is pushing the boundaries? And it's partially true. We've had a couple of theoretical breakthroughs, in particular in terms of how to train deep networks. But they weren't as, it turns out that we had like initially a couple of theoretical breakthroughs. And over the last eight years or so, uh, we've been backpedaling. So initially it was like, you have to do this, otherwise it never works. And then like two years later, it was like, actually, you don't really need to do that. It works anyway. And then the year after that, it would be something like, oh, you actually need to do this always, otherwise it doesn't work. And then it turns out that no, you actually didn't need to do that either. Uh, currently, it's kind of ending up as being it kind of just works. But some of the things that really have been game changers is things like computational power. We are able to process more data than ever, thanks to the advances that we have in particular in terms of GPU computing. Um, there's also data availability. Now, when people talk about creepy governments and other creepy companies uh, collecting information about us, well, you can also mine that information and you can apply machine learning to it. So there's value all of a sudden, and there's also more data out there than ever, because people apparently write about anything on the internet nowadays. And using all of that data, we can actually use that in order to train these algorithms, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. So where do I believe that we will go from here? So this, I guess, is only interesting if you really care about research. But I think that multitask learning, where we're currently really, really good at having a single algorithm that is good at one thing. Like, say, for example, this is the best Go playing AI ever. Or we have an AI that's like really good at driving cars. But this thing we have up here, right, is pretty good at doing not just one thing, but quite a lot of things. Uh, I think, believe that one of the next things that are going to come is multitask learning, where you have an AI that is charged with doing more than one thing, one thing and being good at all of them. And hopefully, being good at one thing actually informs another. I mean, it's not like your brain pretty much has like one visual 
system that only works when you're driving and then you, have, you switch to another visual system when, uh, say for example, you're out walking. Most likely they inform each other and it should be similar in an AI. At least I hope so. I hope also I hope that we will have advanced in reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is pretty much the idea that you don't get your reward immediately. When it comes to a lot of the advances right now, they come from situations where you immediately know if you're right or wrong. Say for example, where if you're classifying, I don't know, um, a, picture, a picture of a car. Like you ask a question, is this a picture of a car? Yes, no. The algorithm answers and says yes, and you say no. That's actually not what you were supposed to say. You were supposed to say something else. And then the algorithm says, ah, okay, okay, I should change my mind regarding this. When it comes to reinforcement learning, it's much more like real life. You don't necessarily know if marrying your partner at an age of 20 was the best of ideas until maybe you're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. Um, so after that, you pretty much have to, after you get the reward much later, say for example, if you're playing like a game of poker or a game of chess, you have to assign every single move, every single decision, a level of how correct it was and if it was the right decision at the time. And this is a really, really hard machine learning problem. And I mean, DeepMind in particular believes that this is where amazing things will happen. Um, I hope they're right, but it's hard stuff. I hope, also hope that we will be working with things like explainable models. Right now it's very hard for us to say, when something goes wrong, like say for example when you translate Lavrov into sad little horse, um, asking the algorithm why did you do this is actually really, really, really difficult because these algorithms are complex and fairly opaque. Uh, I'm hoping that by essentially creating hybrid models which use representations such as logic that is easy for us to handle and at the same time uses these kind of matrix matrix multiplications, uh, maybe we can actually have models that can explain to us why did you decide to classify this person as a terrorist and throw him in jail. Uh, rather than the algorithm saying probability 50% of attack within five years. Um, if you want to get started at home and play around with this stuff, if you already play computer games, you most likely already can. Uh, this is some advice from one of the really, really great students uh, that, we have at U that we've had visiting UCL recently, where you can just look at this list here and see, I think it's actually up to date. Otherwise, go to the source. He is a prolific blogger and a really, really great guy. So you can have a look at that. All right. In terms of Julia, um, we have plenty of frameworks. And I think one of the reasons why we have plenty of frameworks is that this whole idea of building frameworks for deep learning and machine learning is kind of new. Um, a lot of people wondered why Google was so interested, for example, in creating TensorFlow. I think that the reason they were interested in creating TensorFlow is that we're currently in a situation where machine learning is akin to how, say for example, the World Wide Web was in the late 90s, which is this magic cool thing. But if your nephew who's living in a basement can build uh, home pages, why, why can't I hire him in order to drive my multi-million dollar company? Um, so I believe that there's many places where you can apply machine learning and you can then gain value or you can just get some giggles out of it. And I mean, both are fine by me. Uh, so you can have a look at things for so called TensorFlow, JL, MXNet, KNet, and Mocha, and all of these are interesting, are interesting frameworks. There's also quite a lot of uh, interest in terms of talks. We have, of course, this tutorial, oh, sorry, this workshop. We have a talk, I think, tomorrow in the uh, deep learning block on Flux with Mike, which is a like a what would we call it, like a super framework or. Yeah, why not? I like that. Yeah, super framework. It's a framework to rule them all. It abstracts over the abstractions, which abstracts over other abstractions. Not, yeah, yeah, I mean, you get the, you, you, you get the point. Um, there's also Knet, which uh, uses this autograd. I think I'm going to demonstrate Knet a little bit, uh, in a little while, which I quite like. And there's also the uh, TensorFlow JL bindings uh, into uh, Google's TensorFlow, which John will be presenting tomorrow. Uh, I think it's also tomorrow, actually. Um, and I would argue they're actually better than the Python ones, but then again, I mean, that's, uh, there's a joke in machine learning, which is it's a very poor baseline, which means pretty much it's something that's very easy to compare against. It's like saying I run faster than a person without legs. Um, also, if you are into ma <coughs> machine learning and this kind of computing, you should probably also keep an eye on the really, really cool GPU stuff that's going on in Julia at the moment. So we had the tutorial just before us. And also, I think there's a talk tomorrow. And if I missed anything in the schedule, my apologies. Um, but in that case, just poke me later, and I'll be very happy to, uh, to pl plug your machine learning or GPU computing talks. And I believe Julia is in a really like, unique position, because you need computational power. 
and you also need expressivity. It's similar to, in a sense, how it is in like financial banking, where you want to try out your ideas really quick, and you want to put them into production really quick, evaluate them, and then get them back. It's the same re situation in research. It's the same reason. Uh, this is the same way that it is out in out in industry in terms of machine learning, and Julia provides us with really really cool tools for this. All right. So how is it looking now? Okay. Thanks, SVG. Um, how is it looking right now in terms of the uh, the boxes being up and running? Because we're about to do some real stuff now, not just me blabbering. Uh, who here currently has successfully has a uh, a notebook up and running, and also wants to have a notebook up and running? I mean, if you don't, if you just want to see me do stuff, that's perfectly fine. Uh, does anyone succeed in getting the things running on the Julia box? Right. Okay. So in that case. May I inform you that <coughs> we have uh, this wonderful link right here if you want to clone and you want to follow along. And uh, I guess we're running with the backup, with the, with the backup for now. It's experimental technology, but maybe we'll get it working within the next couple of days. Did it work during the, did it work during the previous, uh, during the, the GPU slot? Were they using it? OK, maybe. It did not work. OK, fair enough. So I guess the conclusion then is uh, GPUs don't work. Right, fair enough. Case closed. So let's get started with what I refer to as machine learning from scratch. So I'm now going to try to walk you through essentially what usually takes a couple of weeks or maybe even months. And what the heck? Oh, there we go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gadfly. There we go. So yeah, if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. So I'm going to try to walk you through pretty much an introduction, a quick and sloppy introduction to what machine learning is. And you might be asking right now, why, why is he going to talk about machine learning? This is about deep learning. Well, um, ultimately, if you understand this part of machine learning, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about later makes a lot more sense to you. So first of all, we are going to import and use Gadfly. Please don't pre-compile. Um, then, because we need to plot quite a lot. There's going to be a lot of plotting, and there's going to be a lot of functions. So first of all, we're going to talk about linear regression. Linear regression is the task of learning a function, like a, a specific, a specific, re, a specific continuous function. And we're going to start with a, oh, good lord, please, Gadfly, not now. Uh, we'll, we'll just leave him be for now. And we're going to learn a fairly simple linear function. We're just going to learn the function of x, uh, which is uh, pi times x. It's a simple little function. And we can, of course, plot this in Gadfly. And thank god I did this before the, before the talk. Please, Gadfly. Um, where, let's just run this and have it wait. Oh, OK, that was not the most intelligent thing I did today. OK, I'm not used to notebooks. Um, anyway, we have, uh, simply, we have like a slightly steeper slope than just a standard linear function. Now, in reality, and this is the case in terms of most of, most of machine learning, we actually don't know the function that we're modeling. Say, for example, that I'm doing stock prediction. I don't know the function of the stock market. If I knew, I would probably be pretty rich, and I probably my life would be in danger. So rather, what you know is that you have samples. You have some sort of uh, small little point, points of information. You might say, you know, for example, that these images are of cars, but you don't know every image that is of a car. So what we're going to do is that we are simply going to sample from this function. So we're going to draw 17 uh, random, random samples. And we're going to take the x, and we're going to take the function of x. And if we plot this, I mean, it looks roughly the way we would expect, right? When we have a couple of dots on this specific line. So we're going to try to reconstruct the whole line based on these simple points. Has Gadfly? Oh, thank God. OK, now it's pre-compiling something else. Oh, lovely. As I said, Julia is the future. Uh, but yeah, maybe we need to work a little bit on this part. Um, so now we're going to start with our first model. And we're going to refer to it as a linear model. This model is going to have a w right here, which is going to be of a type, of a type float. And also we're using Julia 0.6, so we're using the new mutable, the new struct keywords. 
And we're going to initialize this little weight just to be something random. So this uh, just gives us a random uh, uh, Gaussian uh, number f drawn from the Gaussian distribution. Uh, and you don't really need to initialize this randomly, but that's the way we do for neural networks later on. So it just makes things a bit na more natural. It doesn't really matter. And we're going to instantiate this model. And we're going to create a predict function. So this is gonna, going to be pretty much what does the model do? So in machine learning, it's usually the case that you have some sort of function that takes a model and takes an input and produces an output. And you can think of this just like the linear function that we looked at previously. OK, something happened. Thank god. Um, I guess I need to. Is it necessary to make that run uh, Come again? How would you need to change that to run 1.5? For 0.5? That simply would say type. Uh, I can change it. Actually, I mean, I can change it to 1.5. Sorry. Um, I guess some of you guys are probably running uh, running 1.5. Let's just change it to 1.5 compatible. Yay! There we go. Awesome. Problem solved. Um, and we're going to create this predict function. And this predict function will work just like we'll take essentially the weight, which we initialized as uh, something that was just random, and we multiply it by the input. And we, since we ran, we initialize this randomly. It's probably not going to look that great, but let's see what our first prediction is. OK, so essentially our model believes that the line should be here. And since all of you guys running it down there have different initial random initialization, you have a different line. But in general, you'll never get it right by guessing. So what are we going to do? We have a line, and it's in the wrong place. So what's the solution to that? Well, what we can do is that we can define what is commonly referred to as an objective function or a loss function. I'm going to try to refer to it as an objective function because I think that's more not objective, thank you Freud, um, rather that it's a, it's a better name. And what the objective function evaluates is how good is our model given the data that we currently have. So if it's a line going completely in the wrong direction, this function should be high. If it's a line going fairly close to the actual line, uh, to the actual line it, should be a better, it, should be, it should be a better value. Uh, in practice, the way we define this is using what we refer to as a mean square objective. So what we do is that we take the model M, we take an imp we take a input X, and then we know essentially this is one of those samples that we pulled previously. And then what we're going to do is that we're simply going to calculate the mean square distance. Right, uh, the, well, this is the square distance, and we're going to divide by two. It, it, that looks like magic, but it's going to make sense in like a minute or two why we do this. And if we want to calculate this not just for a single sample, like a single point, but rather want to calculate it for a set of points, and we're going to refer to this set of points as xys, xys, so xys, uh, we simply calculate the mean of the objective function for each and every single input and output x and y. All right? Straightforward enough, right? So let's see how good our current random, uh, random initialized model is. So we're going to get a number here, and the number is. 1.447, okay, yeah, all right, that doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, this should be zero if we're, doing, if we're doing things perfectly, but it's not zero. So how do we do that? So now we have a measure of how to predict something, and we also have a measure of how good our model is. So how do we improve our model? Well, we can change our W, and we do so by taking the gradient of this objective function with respect to the W. So we can see that there is a w involved inside of here, inside of the, inside of the predict, right? I mean, I could, I could rewrite this as, um, we can rewrite this, right, as, uh, let's see, m.w times x, there we go, like that, right? That's the, that's the same, that means the same thing. So we now want to take this function here, and we want to calculate derivatives. Now, how, who is excited about the, cons uh, about the idea of calculating derivatives? Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I like you guys. <laughs> hey, isn't that the guy that actually implements a library that allows you... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, you, you built a library in order to keep people from doing it. Is it because you want all the derivatives for yourself, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? And now we're going to have to do some high school maths. And this is all pure high school maths. It gets nasty later on, but don't worry. So we can think about the code. Right? I mean, it looks pretty exactly like this. And uh, we can then rewrite it. So instead of saying predict, we can say I, y prime, or y hat is also fairly common. So effectively, what we have right, is that we have y minus y prime squared divided by 2. All right, fair enough. Let's rewrite y prime into, into our weights times x. And then we can just expand, uh, expand on this little thing on the, uh, on the square. right? 
and uh, then we end up with this expression. And now, if you remember from high school, I hope this is high school in the US, at least it was high school for me, but then again, I'm a bit slow. Uh, if you expand this expression, you end up with something like this. And so far we haven't done any derivatives, we just expanded the expression in order to make it easier to calculate the derivative. Now, we can look at this expression, right? First of all, we have this uh, y cube over here. Now, if you remember what your math teachers told you, there's no w, so what does this become? Yeah, exactly. These are the ones that you like, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff in high school. When you see this in high school, you go like, yeah, go away. Um, and uh, then we can simply remove it, so we can ignore that. Then we have uh, minus 2ywx, which of course simply becomes uh, y w y yx, because uh, w here becomes a constant. And the last expression there, we simply get to wx cubed. Now here, this is the reason why we had that, ho that magic little divided by 2, right? So now by using the divided by 2, we can remove those horrible 2's. Thank God. And we can rewrite it, and we can do a little bit more rewriting, and in the end we end up with this fairly nice little expression, which essentially says that you should take the input, multiply it by the input multiplied by the weight, so this will be the prediction, and subtract the actual true number. And this gives you the true gradient. And we can rewrite this as code, like we do right here. And we can run it. So we can have the objective gradient with respect to a single sample, and here we have the uh, gradient with respect to all of the training data that you give. And the current gradient is minus uh, 1.02, yeah, okay, something. Uh, sounds reasonable. Now, it's really easy to mess these things up. And I say that as someone that messes these things up f frequently. I am garbage at maths. And uh, I'm not proud to say so, I'm ashamed of saying so, but it's still a fact. So. How do you know that your gradient is true? Well, it turns out that Newton came up with a cool idea for this. And this is referred to as finite difference. So if you guys remember other things from high school, uh, you remember the, ah, is that, is that who I hope it is? Is that who I hope it is? It is the person I hope it is. <laughs> Thank you. Let's see, yeah, still good on time. So, if you remember the definition, the definition of the derivative, the derivative, right? I mean, you have this little Lehmann's thing, where you pretty much can inf move infinite, infinitesimally. If, uh, sorry, I studied in Swedish, and yeah, the pronunciation doesn't quite work. Clo close, essentially, to the current point, so you get essentially how, what is the, um, yeah, like, what is what is the tangent, pretty much, of the function at the current point. Now we can use the same little trick here. And the, what we can do is that we can take any function. So this is a, actually, this function you could plug into your own code and now you can calculate derivatives using a computer rather than using your brain. Which is perfectly fine by me. So you take a function f and you take an input x and you want to know the gradient uh, for at this specific point x. And what you do is that you take a little epsilon, which should be preferably a fairly small number, and you evaluate the function x and you look a little bit ahead, epsilon ahead, and then you look a little bit backwards, you look epsilon backwards, and you divide it by two epsilons. And this gives you, within a certain margin of error, actually the true gradient. So you can also use, I mean, I know, so, sorry, Aaron, uh, you can use other methods as well in order to get to this. Um, but we can actually try this out. So we can try this out for the function x, uh, x cubed, where we know, of course, that the derivative, if we remember our high school maths, that the derivative of this is uh, 3x squared. And we can plot this. So if you plot this, right, we get these three functions. But it looks only like two functions, right? And that is, of course, because, uh, that is of course because the f2 and f3 essentially are overlapping over each other. So they're actually match matching each other perfectly. And we can calculate also the... Did I actually rerun this? I don't think I did. There we go. And we can also calculate the amount of error. So yeah, trusting plots is a little bit scary. So let's actually calculate the error. So the error of if we draw like something, something around 5,000 samples is the error is 8.76, 10 to the power of minus 14. So it's a tiny, tiny error. We have pretty much recovered the gradient using only computational power. Now, we can do the same thing now if you want to check our gradients. So we can verify that the gradient we previously calculated by hand is actually the true one by calculating one computationally and uh, one using our head. And we end up with exactly the same line. And we can also check the error, and the error is gonna be, yeah, fairly small, acceptable. Most likely we got the right gradient. 
Now, you might wonder, why don't we just use finite difference in order to get all our gradients? Well, it turns out that if you have a network with millions and millions of these kinds of parameters, it's too slow. So uh, you have a quite significant speed up if you don't use things like finite difference. Explicit gradients will always be the fastest, no matter what you do. I, th I think that's true. Maybe I'll be short for that one. Um, all right, so what do we know? Well, we now have a model. We now have a way of determining how bad or good, depending on how you look at it, uh, our model is. And we also have a way of gradually moving our model in the right direction. So now we, what we're going to do is what is usually referred to as gradient descent. So we are, going to gra we are going to move essentially this w so that the w ends up being close to pi uh, without actually knowing that it was pi. And we do so by having this little mu, me, I think me, maybe. Um, where we gradually move. So we, what we'll do is that we will iterate many, many different times. And we will feed essentially into the uh, gradient function our training data, the samples that we have previously drawn for the function. And then we're going to essentially move our little weights and update them. And then we'll save the model weights so we can do some cool stuff. So let's try doing this. Let's run 128 steps of updates. And let's see what happens. It takes half a second or something. And all of a sudden, remember now, our loss used to be like, oh, sorry, our objective function used to give us a number which was significantly higher than that. And all of a sudden, right now, our objective function has gone down. That's a good thing. So we can plot essentially how <coughs> the objective behaves over, t oh, wait, what? Yeah, okay, sorry. Over time, please get play. There we go. And we can see that it starts out being fairly high, and then gradually, as we run the algorithm, as we run the gradient descent, it goes down, and it ends up fairly low down here. That's good. And if you want to look at it in a slightly cooler way, we can see how the model essentially. So it starts out being this line down here, and then gradually it homes in and becomes the true line up here. So now we've learned a fairly simple little function. Let's see. So let's try to learn something that is slightly more complex. Um, let's learn the function f of x pi times x plus e. Okay, really fascinating. I mean, it, we're still not classifying cats or playing Go here, but the same principles apply. And trust me on that one. So <coughs> we have a plot here, which looks fairly familiar, and we can do exactly the same thing we did last time. Let's sample, uh, let's draw 17 random samples from this line. And we get a couple of points on the line, and we're now going to recon reconstruct this function. So now you might go like, all right, but we already have a model, right? So what's the problem? We can, we can just learn this function. So yeah, sure. I mean, let's try applying our previous model, and let's see what we learn. It turns out that that, that line is nowhere close to where it's supposed to be. Um, any takers why this is the case? Essentially, what our model is doing right now, it's what is usually referred to as underfitting. The model is not complex enough in order to actually learn this function. And why is that? Well, this function has this constant offset, which this model cannot account for. Our model always has to go through the origin due to the way that the, mo that the model is phrased. So let's create a slightly more powerful model. And we will create a model that has a W and a B. And this B is usually referred to as a bias. And we can initialize the model. And we initialize it randomly, and we initialize the bias as zero. Yeah, oh. Uh, I introduced a new line. I introduced a new line. Oh, thank you. I'm very happy to have the Julia Parser here with us today. Thank you very much. <laughs> I got to know you a few years ago, but uh, now we finally meet in person. Um, there we go. I think that ran. So we can introduce. And th the difference we're going to make, right, is that we're going to have this as our prediction function right now. So we're going to have the weight times the input, and we're also going to add the bias. We'll use an objective, and uh, if you're observant, you'll notice that it's exactly the same objective as last time. This will be a recurring pattern. And uh, we can calculate the gradients, but they're fairly simple. So if you want to do this as an exercise, just replace, replace y prime with uh, mw plus b, and then just do the, gra do the gradients on there. And this is what, f this is what falls out. And uh, we can just train this model. We'll train it for a little bit longer, but this is exactly the same code apart from the number of iterations that we ran last time, uh, with the exception that we get two gradients now. We get one gradient for the W, and we get one gradient for the B. And we update both of them, and then we save our, we save our current parameters. We save the current version of the model. 
And if we train it for a little while, we can see that, yeah, OK, it goes down reasonably. So let's look at that line. Actually, let's first look at the objective function. So let's see how the objective function works. The reason we look at the, obje <coughs> at the objective function like this is when, when your objective function looks bad, Say, for example, your objective function starts shaking up and down, or your objective function goes down and then goes up again. You're doing something wrong. Lower your learning rate or rethink your model, and it's a great way of debugging your model. And we can also plot it in the same way that we plotted the behavior previously. And we will see that initially the model believes that the line is somewhere down here, but very, very quickly now, since it has the capacity of adding that little bias, it snaps up to the correct position and we see that it homes in on the true function and it, and it approximates the true function. We can, actually look at the, we can actually look at the model. Let's, oh, not edit, sorry. I said not a professional notebook user. Um, we can look at the model when it's trained and we'll see that well, it's not quite pi, not last time I checked at least, not quite e, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, close enough. I mean, we could actually train the model further if we wanted to become even more similar. Now, in reality, as I said, we don't really know the true function. Rather, what we get are, is that we are getting samples from the real world. And samples from the real world, uh, as was noted by the king of mathematics, Gauss, uh, are, frequently <laughs> are frequently Gaussian, uh, uh, like uh, frequently n this noise based on a Gaussian distribution. So what we can do is that we can draw some samples and let's add some Gaussian noise to it. And we end up with a line, and we see now that the points are not strictly speaking on the line anymore. Maybe because of measuring errors, maybe because occasionally the person that was annotating your cat pictures and dog pictures was a bit sleepy and accidentally thought that that cat was a dog. And we can use exactly the same model that we used previously, the linear model with the bias, and we can learn this function. And now when we look at it, we see that the... Uh, Let's see that the loss goes down the way that we wanted it to. There we go. Looks nice. And we can plot the line that we ultimately get. And since there is noise, we're not going to get like a perfect overlap now between the lines, but it's close enough. And this is kind of what you can expect from a real world data set. You'll never get zero, uh, you'll se never get zero loss or zero of your objective function, but you can get pretty close. And it's simply because sometimes your data isn't perfect. All right. So now we've looked at uh, linear, linear regression. Let's now look at logistic regression. Because we've been talking a lot about classifying things, like say, for example, classifying dog pictures or something like that. And that is, of course, not really learning a function in terms of a actual continuous function, but rather learning a decision. So in order to do so, we're going to use my favorite data set, which is not of cat and dog pictures, but rather from, I think it's Ian Murray, uh, which is faculty, I think, uh, in, up in Edinburgh, where he was annoyed at people creating these fake data sets all the time. And he wanted something that was toy, uh, which means easy to work with, and at the same time was real. So he went to the supermarket, actually several supermarkets, and he bought a ton of apples, oranges, and lemons. <laughs> then he went home, and I think he measured the size of them using two CDs, two, uh, CDs that he pushed at both of the sides of them and scratched down with, on a piece of paper, so he got some noise in there. And he calculated them and then published the data set online for people to use. So we are going to learn how to tell the difference between oranges and lemons. We're going to ignore the apples. So this is just simple data loading and we remove the apples and we make our labels binary. And in the end, we're only going to work with the width and the mass uh, rather than the height of the fruit. The height actually isn't really that indicative. So we can do that. We can load that. And if you download the notebook, you got the data as well. Knock yourself out. Lots of fun. And uh, <coughs> we can plot these little things uh, as points in a two-dimensional space. I have no idea why this is so slow. Please. Uh, I kind of need this plot. There we go. And if we plot these things, right, we can see that, um, let's see, the red ones, if I remember correctly, the red ones here are oranges and the blue ones here are lemons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't quite remember what the x axis is. I think the x axis is the width. And uh, so apparently, maybe these are the lemons then. Ah, doesn't matter. The machine learning algorithm doesn't, doesn't care. I mean, if you can't tell, if, if you have a, an algorithm that is perfectly, like if you have an algorithm that is the opposite in terms of accuracy, then just invert the decision if you're doing a binary decision and you have a perfect classifier. So we're now going to do something that is referred to as uh, training and test data. 
And the reason you do this is, say for example that you have uh, a lot of stock predictions. Now, you're not just interested in knowing the past. So if you feed all of your stock prediction data into your algorithm and you train on that, then you're fitting perfectly the past. But what about the future? How do we measure the ability to generalize to things that we didn't train on? It's just like you can't just memorize all of the uh, exam questions from old exams. You also need to think about questions for future exams. So the way you do it, so in machine learning in general is that you split your data into different sets. And they usually refer to as <coughs> a training set and a test set. There's also sometimes a validation set, but we'll get to that later. So what we do is simply that we take our data and we randomly sum sample it. So this will be our training data, these specific points. And the things that we did not include in our training data, we are going to include in our test data. So this will be our testing points. So we will never allow the algorithm to look at the test data. It will only be allowed to look at the training data. And then we'll use the test data to see whether or not the algorithm actually generalizes. And we're assuming that they're drawn from the same distribution, which in this case they are, they're both fruit. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to go into probabilistic framework. And for this, we're going to use the, what is referred to as the logistic function. And this is going to be remarkably similar in the end. Don't worry. It's going to look pretty much exactly the same as it did for linear regression. So we have a function here <coughs> whose domain is uh, between 0 up to 1. So you have a, pretty much a linear function here. And then it gradually slows down towards 0. And you can never go below 0. And you can never go below or go over 1. Now that's nice, right? If we're doing things like probabilities, because you can never have probabilities that low, that's lower than 0 or higher than 1. And if you look at the gradient, you have a fairly strong gradient here in the middle, and you have weaker gradients towards the edges. This actually, um, as an interesting side note, this is the problem that you have when you have a uh, more than three layers or many, many, many different la many, many la layers after each other if you're using these kinds of which we usually refer to as nonlinearities. Because your gradient is very small when you have large numbers. So gradually, as you move between layer to layer, your grad gradient will get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker, and in the end it will be almost zero, and then your model can't learn. And that's still an open problem, I guess, in a sense. So let's create our first classification model. Uh, we're going to use something that looks very similar, right? Uh, we're going to have a W and we're going to have a B. The difference in this time is that we're going to have a, v, a W which is actually two-dimensional because we have two dimensions. The, I think, what was it, the, weight, the, uh, the, mass, uh, the mass and the width, I think, in the end that we used. And we're going to initialize this. Now, this is key. <coughs> when we initialize it, we initialize it as a small value because if you initialize this as a big value, then remember that the gradient is going to be low, right? And then training is going to be slow or maybe even impossible, which is not a good thing. And in terms of prediction, what we're going to do is that we're simply going to take the dot product between our weights and the input. And this, I think, so al like, uh, uh, like uh, matrix and vector algebra is high school maths in the US, right? Maybe? OK, maybe not. OK, in that case, I'm cheating right now. Then we're doing some university maths. So we're going to take simply the, uh, the dot product between these. This will produce a single value, a scalar. And we're going to add the bias. And then in order to ensure that our value can be interpreted as a probability, we will apply the logistic function. And by doing so, we will have a value which is between 0 and 1. And what we can do now is that we can go through our training data. And we can simply print what our current prediction is. And we can assume that if the probability is higher than 0.5, it is an orange. So let's see what our model says. This is a random model, so it's not particularly well informed. It's a bit like me. And uh, you have a y here, so this is true. Here we go. This is actually an orange. And he thinks it is an orange. But on the other hand, the algorithm is saying that everything is an orange, including lemons, which is not a good idea. So we need to train this. The way to do so is that we will apply a new objective function. And we're going to use what is referred to as negative log likelihood. Um, I will, in the interest of time, because I think we're actually running a bit late, um, not go into details here. Um, just take my word for it. This is a nice thing if you're looking into, prob if you're looking into simply maximizing the, max, uh, the probability of all of your training data. And we'll also calculate the function for precision, because I'm not particularly good at reading what like, 0.68 means in terms of this objective function, but I understand precision. So we can run this. And we can see that our current, OK, oh dear. Oh, apparently, that's interesting. That's really interesting, actually. Um, why is the domain wrong? 
how the heck did I end up in a negative number? Aha! Let's try that hypothesis. I guess this is the reason why you... Pardon? <laughs> I'm in 0.6, aren't I? Uh, you kids and your cool functions. <laughs> is it the log? Is it going to be... Angry? Okay, thank goodness. For that. Okay. Anyway, so essentially, right now, we have a 52% accuracy, roughly 53% accuracy on our training data, and we have about 66% accuracy on our test data. So we're doing fairly well, in terms of being random, at least. Now, <coughs> you can calculate the gradient for this. Uh, I'm going to spare you the pain. It's more involved than previously. Fortunately enough, you end up with pretty much exactly the same gradient that you would have for the linear case. The only difference is that you have to apply the sigmoid. But if you remember how the gradient looked previously, this is pretty much exactly the same gradient. So we're going to run this. this uh, also, we can no longer use mean, but this is just the same thing. And we can run this, and uh, we now have a function, and we can get a gradient. So if we have a gradient, we can train. So let's train for 2048 epochs. Because why not actually? Let's, uh, let's double train that baby. There we go. Double training it. And uh, now apparently we have on the training data, we have 94.7% accuracy. And we have 100% accuracy on the test data. That's awesome. Um, and we can plot how this, what this looks like. And hopefully... Oh, that was stupid of me. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, we're running low on time though, so I should probably should uh, move on a little bit quicker. Sorry, just going to rerun a little bit. Um, I was a little bit quick there, because uh, <laughs> that objective function doesn't really tell us much. Uh, there we go, he's training, he should be done within a few seconds, there we go. It doesn't take like four hours to learn this, unlike playing something complicated. But yeah, we can see that the functions are actually following each other. Now, usually, what happens at some point is that your you essentially your objective function will continue going down on your training data, will, will start going up on your t on your test data, and that is because you're memorizing, you're over memorizing and overfitting. Now there are ways to remedy this, and we'll talk about that very briefly. And we can run our function again, and we can see that ah okay, he's pretty good now. Um, he's a little bit unsure about this little bugger right here, so apparently he can't learn this guy. This he thinks is a lemon, although it's an orange. But all of the other things he actually gets correct. <coughs> and we can look at that 100% accuracy on our test data, where we can now see that he actually knows exactly what an orange and a lemon. He can tell the difference between oranges and lemons, unlike quite a lot of other people in society. The, um, in practice, the way that you, if you do have overfitting is that you simply add something like, say, for example, the, um, uh, like the, L2, the L2 norm of your weights. And this is kind of like a bit of a hack. It's a prior that allows us to say that we believe that the model shouldn't really be too good at fitting the training data. Uh, other things you can do is that you can train it a little bit less, and then sometimes you get better performance. But there are a bunch of different tricks. But yeah, we have another 40 minutes. So uh, yeah, why am I going up? I don't know. Let's go to the, my favorite part of the talk, which is going deeper. Now, you guys have seen pretty much what, like, what, uh, like an undergrad, like a later undergrad, early graduate student has seen in terms of machine learning. Now we are going to take the step into deep learning, and we're going to take a step in from so to stop doing these horrible things that you guys don't want to do, which are gradients. And hopefully, instead, what you guys want to do is actual modeling. So we're going to use a real-world data set. This you can download online if you want to which is uh, a data set of housing prices in Boston from 1978. Exciting stuff. And <coughs> in this data set, instead of these artificial functions, right now we're going to try to build a function that goes from these 14 indica f sorry, 13 indicators into the actual value of a home. Right? We're going to build an AI that can predict the value of a home. So things that we're going to look at is like crime rate, proportion of residential land, bound, whether or not it's close to a river. There are a lot of interesting features here. Um, and like how close it is to employment centers. And we're going to massage the data, and then we're going to normalize the data. And it's 
unfortunately often essential to do when, you, when you're learning a function like this. And we're going to pick a random house. And we're going to see what that house looks like. So let's see, we're currently loading the data. There we go. So we picked house number 194. And apparently this home is worth 31,000 US dollars. And is it close to a river? Uh, let's see, number four would be the river. One, two, three, four. Ah, not particularly close to a river. Um, on the other hand, uh, the crime rate around here is actually quite low. So that's nice. All right, let's build a model for this. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to use pretty much exactly the same thing that we used previously. We're going to in, in, uh, initialize some random weights where we're going to have essentially the number of inputs and a, single val and a single value output. So yeah, this is the number of features and we will produce a single value as our output. And we'll also have a bias. And we write a predict function which looks pretty much exactly the same as what we did previously. I mean, the only difference is that now we're using indices as opposed to names inside of a struct. And we'll define an objective function. Any takers, do you recognize this thing? It's a mean squared error, right? Exactly the same thing as previously. And we're going to make a prediction for our random house. How much is the random house worth, worth their AI? Um, well, it's worth complaining about, apparently. He says that it's worth minus 0.03 dollars. That's a pretty garbage appraisal, I think, probably, of the property. He is very wrong. Uh, but let's improve on that. Let's train. So we can also see how bad. So essentially, if we look at the average, like the distance that the, that the method is off, it's off by a couple of millions. So um, not a particularly good AI. Now, we are going to use Knet. If you are running this on your own, you need to install it. So there should also be a package add Knet right there. And we're not going to have to do the gradients anymore because Knet will do this for us because it's trivial to do this automatically, so why not do it automatically? We're interested in modeling, we're interested in essentially learning these functions, not always doing the gradients. So we will use Knet in order to calculate the objective and check that it actually gives us something. So the only thing you need to do with Knet is that you essentially use this grad function, and it's a higher order function, so it goes inside of your objective function, finds out which operations you have applied to your weights, and then finds out the gradients automatically. No more pesky maths. So that's good. There we go. And we have a gradient, and we can train our function. Beam bada boom. And it uh, should only take a little, little while. Then we're going to import, oh god, we're going to import gadfly. Oh dear. Better get started early with this one. Um, so yeah. So currently my computer is running reasonably hot. Come on. And we're going to learn essentially how to appraise a house. There we go. It's now importing Gadfly. So yeah, Mike, um, how are you? How are you doing recently? Good. Yeah, how's it going? Yeah. Um, how, long, how, how long did you have to wait last time you, uh, you, you used Gadfly? I, I just went on holiday. Uh, yeah, me too, actually. I mean, I, I actually flew in, and then I was about to start working on these notebooks, and uh, then I pre-compiled Gadfly for 10 minutes. I'm pretty sure it has to compile a deep neural network to figure out the layouting for plots, so... Yep, I am, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Uh, it's, um... Take some time. It's a nice library, though. Um, come on now. It's not going to be 10 minutes. By the way, compiling LLVM on this, on this little garbage machine takes about, I think, uh, four, four to five hours. So don't use this machine for serious development. Anyway, we can at least look at <laughs> what, the, what the looks like. So this is actually what, using a previous iteration, so we took a random house. The random house here was, val was previously evaluated as at 31,700. And our model actually appraised that it was worth $33,000. That's not a bad appraisal. I think there are human beings that make, worse, make more, like, bigger errors than that. But what is even, oh, there we go, thank you. Here we go. So the loss function goes down and it flattens out just the way we want it to. Nice. And we can now look at our random house again. And our random house, okay, he's off by $900. Not too bad. I'd hire him as a broker. And even more fascinating, we can actually look at the weights in order to understand what kind of indicators are good for house value. And if we do that, 
we see that if you, um, let's see, where is it? If you, for example, if you have a high crime rate that indicates a low value, shocker, um, the proportion of, okay, proportion of non-retail non -retail businesses, essentially industries, is a bad indicator. If you're close to a river, that's nice. What's really nice is average number of rooms. It's actually average number of rooms is a really good indicator right there. And what is a horrible thing, an absolutely horrible thing, is if you are, if you are far away from one of the employment centers. So people really hate commuting, which I guess if anyone lives in the Bay Area probably knows about that. So that's pretty cool. The property tax rate apparently is also a very clear negative. And also people, this one I guess everyone with kids can relate to. Uh, having a bad pupil ratio, teacher ratio, ratio is bad for value. Now, the reason having a having Knet is cool is because I can implement a new model in a matter of seconds. I don't really need to think so much. In fact, I mean, let's change this model right now. Uh, I'm good at not thinking too much. Uh, let's change this value to 68. Like, let's uh, build what is called a multi-layer neural network where we're essentially transforming the data multiple times in a hierarchy. This is a horrible model probably for this task, but we can do it anyway because Knet is awesome. So we can just create this model and we've created a new predict function where essentially we are first taking a value, we're transforming it into other values which are transformed into other values which are transformed into a prediction of, of the actual value of the house. And we can train this for like 4,000 iterations and that's going to take some time. And we can then plot the objective. Uh, this is from a previous run that I did and you can see that this is a horrible model because the loss is going all over the place. But in the end it also makes like worse predictions. So it's a more complex actual deep model but it performs worse than a simple model. But exploring these models and this is what I think is really cool with these frameworks and this is what deep learning is to me. It's Legos. I can take and I can modify and play around with new ways of modeling and new architectures much, much, much quicker than I could ever do before. And this allows me to occasionally make interesting discoveries, but it also makes, makes it possible for me to do really, make really, really cool scientific claims. And using these frameworks, um, Mike and John are now going to be talking about a lot cooler models than the ones that I've done. Yeah, it's still training. Screw that. We are moving on to Mike, because this is going to take ages otherwise. John first? Awesome. Ready? You had, you had plenty of time in the cab. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, either way is fine by me. All right. Okay. So now the boring teacher can go somewhere else, and uh, the cool kids can come in with awesome models and awesome frameworks that you guys can use. Uh, do you take HDMI or do you need a converter or something? Oh, HDMI. HDMI, fine, okay, good. He's still training, so. Oops. So yeah, when people say that they do AI, this is pretty much what they do. <laughs> we don't build robots. <laughs> Oh yes, he's going to need the microphone, indeed. Fair point, very well made. I'll help you with this. Oop. Go, I think that's how you do it. And uh, you, have, you have pockets, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, this, there's a Swedish person, this feels very awkward, but uh, I'm sure. I'm I appreciate it. Hello? Is it working? Um, actually, you, can't, you have to speak into the, the one on the podium. Oh, okay. Hello, I'm John. How is everybody? Good.
All right. Who's excited for TensorFlow? Who's excited for TensorFlow? Yeah. All right, so I have a talk on TensorFlow tomorrow. For now, I'll just introduce it briefly um, so that Mike can introduce his really cool framework that is based on TensorFlow since we're a bit low on time. So here's a Julia notebook. Who here is familiar with Julia? <laughs> Good. So what is TensorFlow? So you guys might not remember or care about the state of machine learning software a few years ago. There was CAFE, there was this other piece of junk that someone made, there was Theano, there was like a million things. And then I was interning at Google and Jeff Dean, the head of Google Brain, was like, this is ridiculous, we should have one state-of-the-art machine learning framework with all the might of Google behind it. Then he said the espresso machine was broken and I went home. <laughs> but then the next day, the whiteboard started filling up with the sketches of what would become TensorFlow. So let's take a look at TensorFlow's GitHub. Can you use the microphone? Yes. So it's sitting here at 61,267 stars, less one. <laughs> no, it's going back. So it's by far, I think by usage, the most popular machine learning system in existence right now. So that's why I became interested in building a Julia wrapper for it because all my colleagues in the Python world were starting to use it, and I felt like Julia, which had interfaces to some of the smaller machine learning packages, would not be able to maintain a large mindshare in the machine learning world unless it had a really good wrapper to TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is mainly a C library of very optimized routines that can run on the CPU and the GPU for machine learning. So the Julia layer mostly just wraps that C layer, and it also uses some parts of the Python API, which we haven't yet ported over, but which theoretically could be. So let me just give you a quick demonstration of how it works. So it's called tensorflow.jl, if you want to follow along. So here I am in my Julia session. I'm just going to use TensorFlow. If you don't already have TensorFlow installed, bigger. If you don't already have TensorFlow installed, then when you do package.add TensorFlow, it'll automatically download the C library that's appropriate for your system. So it does not work on Windows at the moment. It's for uh, Linux and OS X, but a Windows version is in the works. And let me just show you uh, the basics of how TensorFlow operates. So you create a TensorFlow session as such. So now TensorFlow has been loaded. And I can now create some TensorFlow variables. So I'm going to create here this placeholder. So I'm saying x, I'm not going to give it a value yet, but it's going to hold a 32-bit precision number. And I'm going to say whatever y is, it's one more than that. So if you guys are familiar with the concept of lazy computation, it borrows from that framework. So what I'm saying is whatever x is, y is going to be one more than that. No computations actually happened yet. I use this run function to actually do some computation. So I say I want the value of y, it's the second argument. And I've got to tell it the value of all the placeholders that it depends on. Now who knows what this will output? That's what you'd think. And it did it. So that is TensorFlow, thank you, in a nutshell. <laughs> I've never gotten any applause for my PhD research, but this one always gets them. Um, so I can do other things too. So here's my z. I'll say it's, I don't know, sine of y. 
So look what I did. I used a Julia function here, sign, and I gave it y. y is not a number, so how did Julia know what to do with it? Well, this is part of the power of multiple dispatch in Julia. So I took the base sign function, and I said, I'm going to define a custom method for it that takes this special kind of TensorFlow deferred operation, and it returns another TensorFlow deferred operation, which we call a TensorFlow tensor. If you're using, say, the Python API, it's not as nice because you've got two different namespaces of functions. You've got the normal Python sign function, which takes in numbers, gives you back numbers, and then you've got this whole other namespace of functions in the TensorFlow namespace that only takes in TensorFlow operations and returns TensorFlow operations. In Julia, you don't have to think about it because of the power of multiple dispatch. So one of the reasons I like the Julia API over the Python API. So now I can ask it for y. So I can either give it x. All right, what is this going to output? See, now you don't know offhand. So that is the sine of 3, I guess. Or I could choose to bypass this x plus 1 operation and directly specify directly specify a value for y. So when I directly specify a value for y like this, I have done what's called a, um, now this has a name, I don't remember it, but I bypassed this x plus 1 computation. I've just told it to directly do this sign part. So this demonstrates that TensorFlow is a static computation graph system. So that's the main difference between TensorFlow and some of the other popular machine learning packages, um, is that with TensorFlow, you specify this computation graph in advance. So my computation graph here is there's an x, there's a y, which is x plus 1, there's the z, which is the sine of y, and then I can ask TensorFlow compute any part of that computation graph conditioned on the values of any other part of the computation graph, which is pretty nice. And then I can ask TensorFlow for gradients. So I can say, what is the derivative of z with respect to x? So the gradient functionality of TensorFlow is not in the C library, but in the Python API. So when I do this, behind the scenes, a Python process is silently being spun up. The Python process will use the Python part of the TensorFlow API to compute the gradients and then report an error message. <laughs> what did I do wrong here? So that's a great question. The answer is no, because the only thing the Python process does is compute the nodes in the computation graph that are necessary for computing the gradient. It does not actually perform the computations that compute the gradient. That all happens in the C layer, which will, in the ordinary course of using TensorFlow, actually happen on the GPU. Um, Sorry? Can I ask you to eventually bypass the Python layer completely? Yeah. It's really up to... Oh, one Well, anyways, so that's up to the, uh, the Google TensorFlow people. So they're gradually moving the computations for the gradient over from the Python API to the C API. So right now, TensorFlow.gl is 95% just using the C API. As soon as that's done, which is in progress, probably be a few weeks, it'll be completely um, Python-less. 
So that should make things a lot easier. You'll just do package.add TensorFlow. There'll be no worries about any kind of Python dependency problems. It'll just download the C library. It should run smoothly. Although I should say that it already tries to automatically handle the Python dependencies for you. So if you do package.add TensorFlow, it will automatically, if you don't already have the Python TensorFlow version, download it for you and secretly manage it. So you never have to deal with it. Um, since we're running low on time and since I'm giving a whole talk on TensorFlow tomorrow, I'll turn it over to Mike to demonstrate his framework. But be excited that we can use this 60,000 star package in Julia with the same performance as the Python API and with what I think is a nicer API. Oh, I'll take this guy. John. <laughs> Any questions while he sets up? You want your microphone? Yeah. Okay. I'm not quite sure I follow that. Yeah, so so the type of Z, like if you just typed like asked like type of in Julia, it would give you back tensorflow.tensor with a parameterized type of flow32, which would indicate that when executed, it returns back a flow32. So that type is kept across the right? Yes. Yeah, right. Can you use TensorFlow? You absolutely can. And in fact, um, I've overloaded a lot of the Julia display and printing functionality so that when you ask it to view in the HTML mime type many of the TensorFlow objects, it will automatically launch TensorBoard and visualize it for you. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'll. Uh I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the framework which I'm working on called Flux. It's, uh, I have to start by admitting that it's uh, not quite as popular as TensorFlow yet, but you know, we're closing in. A um, <laughs> couple orders of magnitude, whatever. So what is Flux? Uh, I'll kind of explain this, and I have another talk on this tomorrow as well, where I'll kind of try to motivate this a bit more and show why it's interesting. Um, but the basic premise of this is that we um, Rather than kind of doing this graph building step explicitly, we essentially just take a Julia function and run it using TensorFlow, uh, or MXNet, or really any other kind of data flow graph-based machine learning backend. So we have a, a function here, f of x. Um, this is totally normal Julia code, more or less. The only thing we've done here is uh, annotate this with at net. And what that does is it says, uh, run, act as if this function is data flow, rather than you know, a, a normal kind of imperative Julia function. Um, and so then we can call it. Uh, uh, including with an array, which would be more interesting from. So, so this is kind of you know, basic stuff, but the thing is we can convert to MXNet or TensorFlow or something like that. So we've just wrapped this and said MXNet F, okay. Now we have a new version of that function. We call that function and we get about the same result. So this is very kind of minimal. Um, there's, but there's, you know, there's very little boilerplate here. You can see that MexNet has converted to float32 because that's what it works with natively. Um, but basically, this is running on that back end, and it will run with, uh, with GPUs if you have them, things like that. Um, and we can compute backwards passes and things like that. So it's very similar to the kind of code you saw earlier with Pontus's logistic regression and things like that. You can write that kind of code and get back uh, something you can train and work with as a machine learning thing. So I'm going to talk more about that tomorrow, but I thought today I'd kind of give a quick overview of 
uh, a slightly more advanced kind of model, uh, which is recurrent networks. And the reason the recurrent networks are interesting is we can use them to process sequences as opposed to just kind of like static, statically shaped data, like the housing data, which is a set of, you know, five features, or images, which are just big arrays of numbers. Um, recurrent networks can process things like text. They can do things like the, uh, the speech generation stuff you saw earlier. That's what kind of, you know, mostly recurrent networks. So that's why these things are interesting. And I think it's kind of quite non-obvious how we go from like this this like tiny set of numbers over here for like how the housing data versus using this with images and like really structured data. So I want to kind of try and give you an intuition for how that works. So the way we do this basically is that machine learning models always work with some like finite set of numbers. So we work with a vector or an array of length n, 500, 300, doesn't matter. And then we get back a vector of that same kind. So the trick in doing machine learning problems usually involves like how do we get the data into that format? With something like the housing data, whether it's all numerics, that's kind of easy. Uh, but with text, it's a bit harder. So the way we do this um, for characters, for example, is what's called a one-heart encoding. So in this case, for example, we decided that an alphabet is uh, A to Z. And we call one-heart to get that into uh, to turn a letter like C into encoding within that, uh, within that space. So this is essentially just a list of booleans. Um, but we can change this to E, for example. And we see that whichever the letter of the alphabet is, that gets turned into a 1. And this is something now we, we can now use. So we can use the same techniques as Pontus used earlier, multiplying by a matrix or adding a bias and things like that. And our framework will know how to deal with that. We can do the reverse as well. So uh, turn a random thing into a, back into a letter, while our, our uh, network, once it runs, is going to express its confidence in, uh, in terms of like what, what letter is, should output as, as a vector like this. So, A6. So that's just the reverse process as one hot. So this is taking a, a letter to uh, a sequence. This takes a sequence like this and says, what's the maximum value of that sequence? It's uh, here, say, 99. Um, that might be 99% sure that this letter is coming up next. And then we just turn that. So it's the same as argmax, um, essentially. And then so we know that this, this output of the network represents a letter. So for example, uh, we have a network like this. So this is a simple affine transformation with some activation function on the end. Um, if we call that with f of rand 26, then this is, a, this is a network which is working with a vector of real numbers. But with this kind of encoding and decoding of digits, uh, we, can, we can work with letters. And so now we have a network which transforms one letter into another letter. Uh, simple as that. And so at the moment, that's totally random, but you know, it's starting to, we're starting to work with cool like, data we can understand as opposed to just numbers. So the second thing we need to understand is the idea of recurrent models. So this model here uh, will always return the same letter for the same input letter. So that's not really the right thing to do uh, in most like sequence data cases. So the example I have here is if, uh, if you give the model a T, it should really react quite differently if the letters before that were LA versus BI, for example, because it should predict, well, what comes after T? Well, that depends on what came before T. Um, and so we want the model to have some sense of what's, what's happened uh, in previous times that it's been called. And so that's where the idea of recurrence comes in. So we have this notation here, count minus one. And so Flux gives us this slightly magical syntax, which basically says, uh, I, want the, I want the value of this variable, not from the current time the function is being called, but from the previous time. So we define that function and roll it. And then when we call it, the first time it returns one, the second time it returns two, and so on. So this is behaving, in this case, exactly as if we had said, exactly as if this had been a global variable. Um, but it's a bit different from that because Flux knows about it and can do some interesting things with it. 
How's it doing that? So um, basically this syntax will insert, so this, we're interpreting this function as a graph. Um, this syntax inserts uh, a cycle into the graph and then it gets enrolled by flux in the background. So in this case, if we do unroll one, we'll end up with a stateful model which has as part of its uh, state something like this. So, and if we, perhaps I states. So Flux is handing the statefulness of this thing for you, like a closure, like something like that. So um, it's contained within the model. So essentially the, the important concept here is that the network can keep some kind of memory about what's happened to it in the past and aggregate some information over everything that it sees. So in this case, the aggregate is just a count of how many times you've called it. That's all very interesting. But in a more complex case, if we were processing a sentence, we might pro like store where we are in that sentence. The other thing we can do is we can uh, do something called unrolling, which basically is uh, it's, it's the same thing as calling it multiple times, but we do that all of those calls at once. So if we do zeros again here, we'll get one, two, three, four, five, the count for each element of the sequence. Um, but the point is that instead of calling one at a time, we can put the whole sequence in at once. So now if this was taking letters, um, we could input a whole sentence rather than just one letter at a time. And it would behave the same way. So here's a basic RNN, and it's very similar to the affine layers and things like that that you saw before. We do a matrix multiply of X, and we add a bias, and then we return that value. But the difference in this case is that we've taken, uh, we've included the last output of the network. So we're using the last output of the network as an additional input, which we mix with the current, uh, with the current output. And so in this output, which is going to be, so we can see, for example, that, so we do the same thing again, calling it with some letter. We have to call it multiple times. Uh, each time we call it, we feed back its own input into it, and then we end up with some random string. Uh, this is not particularly interesting, except to point out that you can actually see some kind of structure here. So if I do like, if I do a purely random string, this is just choosing letters completely at random. You can see a bit more structure, it's biased towards certain letters more than others in certain sequences. Um, so for here, for example, we see the LN sequence come up a few times. And this is the structure which we can start to exploit. So knowing that this model can, uh, in, in some ways, encode these kinds of patterns, we can tweak it so that it encodes certain patterns more than others and gradually start to generate something more coherent. I'll skip the data kind of handling stuff because we're kind of starting to run out of time. But the basic uh, idea here is that we want to take a batch of these things and turn them into a sentence. So in this case, we, uh, so we want to load some data like Shakespeare, for example, um, and which is obviously a sequence of characters. So we can do uh, input. So I have a text source. And this is the text source that we can then use to, uh, to train this, this model. So if we encode this, we just go across this whole sequence of characters and we encode each one. So now we have, uh, because we have the first few letters, our alphabet consists of, uh, of everything that we saw uh, inside this. So every, every letter that turns up in our Shakespeare data set will be in this alphabet. And then we encode it so that each letter uh, is in this, in this, in this uh, numeric form. And so now our, our data, which was this kind of human readable string, is now just a big matrix, which is something that our, again, you know, the goal is getting something our model can deal with. And likewise for the output, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, give, we're going to do, so uh, our training process will be to give the model each of these characters in sequence. So and for each character we say predict the next character in the sequence. So if we give the model an F in this encoded form, it should return an I for 
because it knows that that's likely to come after f. Uh, f is much more like uh, i is much more likely to come after f than t is, for example. So we should learn that that's the kind of thing that comes up, uh, and we'll train it and we'll say. Uh, when it gives us this, uh, we can do the exact same thing we did before. If the model generates a big encoding which says uh, this should be a T, we can say that's wrong, it should be an I, and we gradually tweak the weight so that it comes up with I's after it reads F's. So yeah, there's some uh, data handling stuff over here, but it's quite easy. Uh, so finally, we build our recurrent models. So we use a slightly different syntax for that in this case. Uh, what we can also do is we can chain these things together. So we take the output from one recurrent layer and we treat that as a hidden layer, which we then feed into the next uh, recurrent layer. So this is how we make our uh, uh, models deeper and more complex. So now this layer, instead of operating directly on characters, it's operating on some kind of more complex hidden state within the model. Uh, and that may be kind of gradually pulling out features out of the text we've given it. So I won't show the training because it will uh, take a while in the system, but I will show the sampling function. So the sampling is just a slightly more complex version of the version we had earlier on, where we kind of just use this, just put data into the model and pulled out the answer. So we're going to do the exact same thing here. Uh, we'll give the model an F. It says, OK, uh, up next will be an I. We say, OK, fine, we give the model the I. It comes up with an R, and so on. And eventually, we get the text of Shakespeare, we hope. So then let's try sampling this. Yeah, some deprecation warnings because 0.6 has just come out. Uh, but it's down here. So eventually, uh, this model is actually learning to generate something like Shakespeare-esque text. So it's learned the patterns that come up in Shakespeare and what kinds of things come you know, after, after some words and so on. So let's do the bit of a longer sample and uh, show it. So that's just uh, loading. So we're, we're doing like a, this model is quite big, and there's a lot of you know internal matrix multiplies and, and so on. So, and there's no optimization on this particular part. So here we go. So this, if you have a look through it, uh, is reasonably hard to tell apart from Shakespeare. That's. <laughs> If there are any like English literature people, I'm sorry, that's probably really insulting, but yeah, that's, that's for me. <laughs> but to, to balance it out, maybe, so I actually also tried training this on, um, on Julia code. So you can take all of the base Julia source code, uh, just, just turn it into one big text file, right? And you've got, say, 100,000 lines of Julia code, and you get this. Uh, it would be great to make it compilable, yeah. It's, I think there's, there's the occasional uh, missed opening or closing bracket and things like that. But generally, it's quite convincing. Um, <laughs> it's doing some metaprogramming. It's got like conversions in there. Uh, it's got some types. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth a shot. I don't know what cannot T1 does. Uh, I pulled out, so I pulled out a few uh, like name inspiration things from here, like Java Triangular. Um, if anyone wants to like try and implement these and like figure out what they do, then let me know. I'm curious. <laughs> Unpuff. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of amazing that this kind of actually very simple algebraic model can uh, learn like all of this complex structure, right? So. Bearing in mind, again, we're doing this pure character by character. So we say, here's a space, what comes after? Space, here's a space, what comes after? Space, eventually four. And it's stored in that hidden state is some kind of like push down automaton, which says that we are currently indented three levels. Um, and all that, you know, we should, we're inside function arguments, so we should have a type parameter. Like that, that's kind of amazing that it learns this stuff. Um, and it's a very simple model. So I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's about all we have time for. I was hoping we could kind of follow along uh, through that and do some, do some more interactively. But I hope at least this guy here who was on Julia Box has done that. Everyone else, uh, yeah, it'll have to be what it is. So yeah, uh, thank you very much.
Uh, it takes a good few hours. Uh, so you can kind of get something vaguely coherent in, in half an hour or so, uh, if you want to get it really good, like train for a day or something. Yeah, I, I started training with the trunk at least because I'm quite frankly tired of in order of places. Fair enough. 